for anyone who's really uh, really interested. It happens. Let me tell you, like I had a local historic district meeting earlier this week or last week, and it's like in five days there's already twenty something views, and wow. I was like, oh wow, you know, there's you know a few people in the audience, but it's amazing that then it's been viewed two dozen times in like three days. I think it's I think it's you, Nate. Everyone just wants to see you. <laughs> yeah, like oh, I hear Nate Malloy's back. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Miss that guy. <laughs> That's great. So there's 10 people here. Oh, Becky, I'll make you a co-host. I guess I haven't done that. Oh, I don't think you need to. Oh, to just in case you know anything happens, you can okay. allow attendees to speak or okay. share a screen or other things. So okay, great. Um all right. Well, we will um bring the meeting to to order then it is um, 7.07, um, and seeing as a quorum of committee members is in attendance, this public meeting is being called to order. So I welcome everybody to the January 10th, 2023 public hearing, or public meeting, I should say, of the Amherst Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by the state legislature on July 16th of 2022, this meeting is being conducted virtually using the Zoom platform. The meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as usual. So now I'm going to do um, a roll call of those in attendance. Um, and actually, when I call on you, why don't you also introduce yourself um, for and how long you've been on the committee? And I'll start first with Matt. Yes, I'm Nat Larson. I think I've been on the committee, I'm just guessing now, maybe five years. Um, and so it's always been a pleasure. Many of the same um, applicants uh, submitting proposals, and it's always good to hear all the good work that everyone is doing. Great, thank you. And Greg? You're muted, Greg. Is that better? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Greg Bascom, and this is my uh, first year on the committee. Great. Thank you. And Suzanne? Hi, Suzanne Schilling, and also my first year on the committee. Everybody knows you, but I'll let you introduce yourself too. Sorry, me? Yeah. Sorry, I was just watching the attendees. Sorry, Nate Sorry. Malloy, a planner with the town. I'm staff liaison to the committee. Great. Thank you. And I'm Becky Michaels. I'm um, I've been on the committee for two years, and I um, am the chair, the recent chair, um, taking over for Gail. So this is my first um, round chairing the this particular um, meeting where we're making these kinds of decisions. Um, and so I welcome everybody who's in attendance, and thank you to my fellow board members for being here. Um, the meeting format tonight, the, the purpose of tonight's meeting is for us to decide um, which organizations to recommend to and which um, non-social service um, entities to recommend or projects to recommend to the town manager um, for use um, using the, the community development block grants and, um, and then also to recommend uh, the amount that we um, should give to each of those organizations. The, um, the way that we're going to format the meeting is that and we're first going to start um, and do a discussion about the non-social service organizations. We're then going to discuss the social service organizations. And throughout that time, there may be um, questions that arise in our committee discussion where we may ask if there is a representative from the organization present to join us um, in the panel area um, to, to talk to us, if, to explain certain parts of the application or, or questions that we have. And I'm thrilled to say that we are actually able to have you come in as a panelist and so we can actually see you. Um, in the past, it was just seeing your, your photographs. Um, but if you are comfortable being on screen and, and live and, and in person, that would be great. And if not, that, that's your call. Just um, don't turn your, your video on. Um, but hopefully, you know, we'll be able to have a, a conversation with you um, speaking to the, to the audience. Um, what we are um, planning to do, this is a, a public meeting, not a public hearing. So we are, um, we are all here really to talk amongst ourselves about what to do, but looking for, as I said, to, to turn to the audience members where we have questions. Um, and I, I wanna assure the audience members that we are, as are a group that has 
poured through your applications and really read them very carefully. We understand um, as best as we think we can what it is that you're you're looking for the grants to do. Um, we also have an understanding of what your organizations do, both from your grants, but also as community members in Amherst. And um, I'll just say at the outset that every single application we got is from an organization that really does extraordinary work. And the task that we have tonight um, can be can feel sort of impossible, you know. And I remember from last year, sort of talking about how do you rank housing over eating over. I mean, it's just these these questions that are are beyond anything that we could try to answer. And so that we we understand that each one of you does really incredible and important work. And um, and so the what we're going to ask of you is to really answer our questions more than to make presentations about your organizations. Um, that said, at the close of our discussion, when we have come up with a consensus. Census. We will open the floor if people do want to make um, make some comments. Um, again, really would ask you to focus if you think that there's an area that we missed that we didn't understand from your application. Um, and we will limit um, everybody to three minutes per organization um, in that period of time. Um, and then after that, we'll then move into the discussion about um, the budget specifically. Um, and then I think at the um, conclusion, we then have a couple of other business items around target areas and anything that um, we were unaware of before the agenda was posted. Um, so with that said, I think we'll get our discussion started um, around the non-social service organizations. And um, I'm assuming all committee members have a copy of the preliminary proposal rankings that just had the rankings that we had sent in to Nate to compile. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the ways to get this started is to, I mean, we're sort of fortunate in this matter in that we can only give to three non-social service organizations and we only got three non-social service organization applications. Um, so the question is really, do we give to all three or do we focus um, on just um, one or two of them? Um, and um, I actually do have a question. I don't know whether there's anybody here from um, Valley CDC. Nate, do you? There is, yeah. There is, okay. Um, because I actually did have a question about that. And we'll, before we invite um, the representative in, we'll, we can talk amongst ourselves a little bit. But um, the question that I have just to my fellow um, committee members is that I did learn from, from Nate yesterday that there were some funds that had to be returned to Valley CDC because there were not enough businesses that had applied to use those funds. Um, and it's for similar projects or same projects that they're applying for now. So I was, I was going to ask Valley CDC about um, the fact that we just returned monies to them and sort of what's different now and, and why more money would be needed for the same kinds of projects. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has any other questions around that or even wants to discuss it before we call somebody in. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to say I, I, I like the uh, Valley CDC proposal. I think we've talked as a committee, one of the things that, that um, we wanted to think about as an overlay on a lot of these proposals, especially the social service ones, um, are, you know, kind of um, you know, racial equity and, you know, less represented groups and so forth. And so I think that, that um, you know, the Valley CDC um, kind of target, uh, you know, business person, I think, is often a um, less represented um, business person in town. And so I think that that's a great way to, uh, you know, kind of look at that uh, overlay of social justice um, in the context of the non-social service projects. Yeah, I agree. So um, why don't we invite in the representative so we could just sort of talk a little bit about the, the money piece of it um, and understand that better? Sure. So Hi, Alexis. Hi. Hi. Oh, great. We can hear you. Perfect. Thank, Thank you for coming in. And I don't mean to <laughs> suddenly put you on the spot with this question, but it was, oh, no. um, it, um, it was, it's a very expected question. And oh, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> totally reasonable. So uh, for folks who don't know me and I will also, so, okay. So first of all, I'm Alexis Breitnecker. I'm the executive director at Valley Community Development. Um, I've only been with the organization for a year. 
Um, Iyad Salha is also on the Zoom and he is actually our, one of our small business. We have two folks in small business, um, Sarah Sargent, who's on maternity leave and Iyad who just started with us in October. So if there's anything that I can't answer more specifics about the small business program, Iyad certainly can answer them for you. Um, and Nate, you know this, I think probably better than I do because you, <laughs> you have more tenure than I do with the program. My understanding in part about the having to give some money back is because all of the COVID emergency funding that we received from the town of Amherst, um, we had to attend to it first and it sort of like backlogged our ability to spend down CDBG funding. A similar thing happened with us in Northampton as well. Um, you know, there was this massive influx of um, COVID emergency grant funding that was targeted to small businesses. We gave out something like 1.2 million between Northampton, East Hampton, Amherst, and Southwick and Pelham. Um, and so the, the, the attention was really on those. And then we got through all of that money and then we're like, oh, we have this like regular money from CDBJ that we have to spend down and we just couldn't quite get through it. So uh, Nate, you can correct me if I miss anything about that. No, no, I think that's it. I mean, I think when I was speaking with Becky, you know, the town we did through with Valley try to reach out to as many businesses as we could. And sometimes the businesses are reluctant to come forward. And so even if there are, you know, hundreds of businesses in Amherst that may be eligible, not all those were willing to come forward. And so, you know, block grant does require more paperwork and, you know, income eligibility requirements mm -hmm. than say ARPA funding or other funding that's been available. So, you know, I think it's been, you know, I think statewide, we found that the microenterprise program administered with block grant money was slower to get out and, you know, had more, you know, say threshold barriers for businesses. And so they were reluctant to use the funding. Mm -hmm. um, but Becky, to your sort of like overarching question of like, why are we asking for money again? Um, it's in part because we didn't want to just drop off the radar. So if we didn't ask for money, um, we we felt like we wouldn't be able to really dig in in Amherst in a way that we could. So we have CDBG funding currently from Northampton um, and we get um, mass growth capital funding to do like sort of larger small business work um, in all of Hampshire County, but it, it, you know, it isn't targeted to Amherst. And we, we think that that's an incredibly important community. It's an incredibly important small business community. Um, and so we wanted to keep our foot in the door, quite honestly, um, and didn't want to just pull ourselves out from two years of funding. Okay. Well, and it sounds like also, I mean, if a new business comes along in the next couple of years, it wouldn't have, I mean, the, the monies that were given back wouldn't have been applicable to it anyway. So it's really, we're really talking about future development, right? Yeah. Okay. And this is, you know, it's, it's a, it's two years, it's really 15,000 a year, which we feel like um, sort of is in line and the numbers that we proposed, the number of businesses that we proposed meeting, we, we think we can meet those targets. Okay. Does any other board member have any questions for Alexis? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Alexis. Of course, yeah. I'm gonna change your role back, Alexis, to an attendee, if that's all right. So I do see board members that um, that Dave Zymek is here as well. If anybody has any questions about either the Southeast Street project or the Belchertown Road project. And my understanding as we look at all of these is that with the Southeast project, because it's a, a smaller project, um, it, it would be if we're, well, let me rephrase it. If we're thinking about sort of uh, um, percentages or amounts to give to each one, there's less to reduce in that one and less kind of room to, to do less of it because it's a smaller project versus the Belchertown Road project, which is a, a much more extensive project and where things could be sort of taken out of it. Um, and if I'm incorrect about that, then, um, well, Nate, you'll let me know. And yeah, no, I think that's correct. Yeah, so, you know, we have to build up to the budget, right? So we have about 1.1 million. So not every you know budget fits neatly into that amount. So we have to, you know, have to make some recommendations and cut some budgets. And so, you know, it'd be hard, for instance, on the Southeast Street project to recommend 150,000 and then the rest go to Belchertown Road and then Valley because 150,000 just isn't going to, you know, provide, you know, we could scale it down a lot then, right? We'd do, you know, the fencing or something, but it wouldn't be much of what was proposed. Right. Whereas on uh, Belchertown Road, it's a $2.5 million project. The town has secured 755,000 in MassWorks funding. We've applied for other funding. 
and we'll put in local capital money in chapter 90. So we're building up that budget now. And so it's a little more flexible in terms of if it's reduced a bit. Um, yes. So in my, in my very simplistic um, look at this, I guess I, I thought, well, if we give 30,000 to Valley CDC, then if we just take the remainder and divide it up proportionally, um, the larger project um, is about 60% of the total, um, you know, 1.655. So is it, you know, if we just split it 60, 40, is that a reasonable way to approach it? It could be. Um, do you have those numbers? I, have a I can share my screen. I have a spreadsheet up and so we can. Yeah, so, so the way I looked at it was um, just, no, deducting the thirty thousand leaves us with one hundred and one million forty-two thousand five hundred, and if we just split it sixty forty, then it comes out to. Oh, I can't see my screen. Oh, sorry. Did I? Uh... No, no, no. That's okay. I just have to minimize that a bit. Uh, so then it comes out to 625.50 and 4.17. Yeah, let's do round numbers quickly. Yeah. So I guess my question would be what, <laughs> I mean, since it's all going to the town of Amherst and this is the amount we have, so it's clearly going to go to it. I guess I would almost turn to the town and say, what's easiest for you? I mean, if, if we look at what our um, our voting was, the Southeast Street project certainly had more, more people felt that it was a more important project than the Belchertown Road one. So um, my inclination looking at that would be to say, let's fund that entire project and then the remainder would all go to Belchertown Road. Um, what do people think about that? Yeah, Becky, that, I mean, I kind of, I just did the math on who ranked what, you know, gave point basically assignments to everyone who ranked, you know, first, second, third, and came up with a point value basically for each project. So I'm kind of in line with you since if, you know, if, the the southeast street had the highest ranking among everybody i i would feel more inclined that that i would want to give more of the percentage like a somehow weight that percentage higher to fund closer to the total amount of that project um and then since we can fund three, I think the 30,000 is kind of fair since it's such a small number compared to the $1 million number. Um, but I guess I have also a similar question to you about since the other two projects are town of Amherst, can we allow them to decide that allocation or we have to say what we're funding for each project? I have a question and I had comments. <laughs> but yeah, no, so yeah, so we've never really been in this position where we, the committee could leave it up to the town. And so, you know, maybe that there isn't um, such a strict recommendation, you know, however, you know, like Becky said, it seemed like the way the rankings worked, Southeast Street was um, more favorable. So maybe, you know, if it's not a dollar figure that, you know, you know, put as much money as needed into Southeast, you know, Southeast Street and the remainder into Belcher Town Road. It could be something like that. Mm -hmm. When we apply for funding to the state, it has to be, um, you know, project and budget specific. But if in the future, if, you know, depending on how bidding works or whatever, we can move money between the projects. And so it could be that we allocate, you know, 600,000 to Southeast Street and the remainder to Route 9. But if we need to move some funds around between the two, to make the projects happen, we could do that. Of course, I'm also mindful of the fact that whatever we say, it's just the recommendation. So the town manager can always say, well, from the town perspective, you don't want to put more money towards one or the other. But right. true. Right. Um, well, I think I'd be inclined to to do it that I mean to to say to sort of phrase it in that way and to put the the 655 toward Southeast Street. The rest of it will go to Belchertown Road, but knowing that 
whatever needs to happen, you know, if money needs to be shifted around when the projects are being built, then or constructed, that's that's what will happen. I mean, doesn't seem like we should spend too much time figuring out the specific dollar amounts, <laughs> right? <laughs> in the end, it's going to these two projects yeah. in capacity. Right. And no matter what, we're not going to be able to give the one million to the Belchertown Road. Correct. Um yeah. Unless we said nothing to Southeast Street, you know, if we said nothing to anyone. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right. But we're not going to do that. So um all right. Well then in that case, um, I guess what we should do just sort of to go back to my original piece where I said after the discussion we would allow the um organization representative to chime in if they wanted um, or had anything to add, I would just turn to, to Dave in the audience and see if he wants to raise his hand if he wants to come in. And if not, then um, propose that we can go ahead and, and reach our consensus vote on this. And I can't see the participants anymore. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. There's still 11 attendees and Dave hasn't raised his hand. So, okay. I can... okay. So, um, so then Nate, do we need to do an official vote or we can just literally just say, I mean, you know, I think at the end we could just, we could take one official vote voting all the recommendations. Um, you know, if it seems like the evening is getting late or the committee can't necessarily, um, pin down recommendations for social services, we could always go back and say, here's our, at least our recommendations for the non-social services, so. Oh, it looks like he's raising his hand now. All right. All right, Dave, you're gonna be asked to become a panelist and then you can join. Hello, everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. I'll be very brief. I'll be very brief. Thanks for for uh, bringing me in as a panelist. But no, I, I I was listening to your 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 conversation just now, and I and I think that that sounds like a really good approach. You know, I just wanted to put a plug in. You know, um, working with Nate and working with the town manager and our DPW and and the planning department, we're really excited about these projects in the East Village. Um, you know, we. We know the town has selected the, the Fort River school site. Um, we have the Wayfinders project coming in at the old um, um, uh, East Street School. And then our, our project, uh, that project also has a site on Belchertown Road. So, and, and I think when you travel through the East Village, you realize um, it's, it's an area that needs a lot of attention from sidewalks to paving to streetscape and the list goes on. So as Nate said, we've, We've begun to amass an, uh, a number of grant dollars and Chapter 90 money and, and other funds. So this money will go a long way. And I, I like the way you were, you know, um, talking about it, which is if, if, you know, giving the town, obviously it is the town manager's recommendation, but um, honestly, he takes your, your evaluation and your recommendation very seriously. I've been working with Nate on this for 10 plus years, and um, it, it's unusual for the town manager to to um, deviate from your recommendations that far. So, but in this case, we do have two years of funding and um, it's exciting to think that we can maybe do all of the work um, on, near the East Street School and then the remainder could go toward the larger project. As Nate said, I think it's about $2.5 million to do Belchertown Road. Um, but there is a lot of new development happening down there. There's new housing going in, uh, there's new housing starts, so it's exciting. So happy to take any of your questions. I know you have lots of work ahead of you, so don't want to take up more time. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Does anybody have any questions? All right, thank you so much. Um, all right, so um, to the committee, it sounds like, are we generally um, in agreement that we would do um, the Valley CDC for its full amount of 30,000 and then um, essentially funding all of, or most uh, recommend recommending funding most or not all of the Southeast Street and the remainder going to Belchertown? It's fine with me. Okay. Why? I agree. Okay. Yeah, and like I said, so throughout the we have time before we submit our application, so we can refine budgets and then yeah. you know we'll make it make it work. Right. Um, mm -hmm. um 
Okay, well then let's move to the um, the more difficult decision making that we have ahead of us. Um, and um, it sounds like we all probably did some version of what Suzanne described of trying to figure out sort of the most votes for this and, and waiting, waiting different things. And um, Nat, I was remembering that last year you had done a couple of different versions of sort of these are the top five and 80% to each one of them and all of that. And so um, I guess I would, you know, just like to open the conversation and just um, and see if people, you know, want to talk about what um, what their their math showed them <laughs> as they were looking at at the rankings. Yeah, so here I, you know, I could, we can share for um, the public and for the committee. This was I don't know how how visible that is. It's if I need to enlarge it or not. It's um, but you know we had the committee rank proposals as part of the review process, and so here are the individual rankings. It's not you know um, a score. It's a you know in a rank order, and that just gives you an idea of how things um, you know how the review process ended, and so. I know Becky had done some counting, like, oh, which one received, you know, say the number one position or two ranking. And, you know, sometimes that's easy to say, okay, well, does one or two float to the top and some, you know, some don't. And then there's a discussion for the ones in the middle. And so, um, you know, if there's a place to start, that could, that could be one. Yeah, I know. I, so with my ranking, it came out with big brothers, big sisters, so that sort of, of the, the top looking at who is in the top five and what vote, how many votes they got for the one through five. It was Big Brothers, Big Sisters, the Survival Center and Craig's Doors were the top three vote getters for weight. And then Amherst Community Connections and um, Family Outreach were the next, were tied again in the next set of amounts. Is that essentially what other people got? I had family outreach as having the most out of everyone. And I think on um, the second to last um, column mm -hmm. and the second ranking, that Where should be family outreach of Amherst or oh. Amherst Community Connections, no, I think. I think that's- I mean, family outreach. It should be family outreach, sorry. That must've been a copy and paste or a um, auto fill. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah, this one right here. I wrote it in and didn't count it. Okay. So yes. So it should be family outreach. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So based on that, I had family outreach as kind of the top out of everyone, and then survival center and big brothers, big sisters, and then Craig stores. Those were my those were the one, two, three, top four with Amherst Community Connections as fifth. I think I did the same uh, math as uh, Susanna took the average, um, you know, ranking from each person. So family outreach averaged 2.17, uh, Survival Center 3.0, Big Brothers 3.0, Craig's Doors 4.17, Community Connections 4.67. So those were the top five. And same. then there was there was a little bit of a jump down to um, Center for New Americans and Literacy Project tied at 6.17 and Senior Center at 6.5. Yes, my math was in reverse of yours, Nat, but same exact. <laughs> the people that were tied were tied. Um, yep. And yeah. And I realized I did Amherst Community Connections did especially well because I counted it an additional time. And right. So I said that that should have been family So good. I'm glad we have um right it's just there um but it was it was interesting to me that that there was quite some dispersal for example um you know craig's doors was number one ranking for a couple of people and number eight ranking for one person yeah i found that interesting too yeah. and so there's not that much consensus and that's why i kind of was curious what the average ranking was and even even um i took out the high and low and just uh you know took out the uh took the average of the remaining ones in the middle and it came out to the same ranking a little bit different numbers but same ranking anyway so i think the 
ranking is fairly clear. Now that doesn't necessarily translate into, you know, how much, you know, which one is chosen and how much um, is funded. But but I think the ranking that resulted from all of our looking at the applications are, you know, pretty consistent. So yeah, I can share the spreadsheet. I just type that that um, you know, that list down here. That order um, is highlighted here in yellow. And so yeah, I mean, I don't you know, I don't know how committee members feel about that. Do you you know, is it just the top five, or is there some um, you know, I mean, maybe there is a discussion about there are priorities that were listed in the in the request for proposal. Are we hitting hitting those? Um, and then another um, discussion that that we've had before is whether we want to try to um, fund organizations in some of the different kinds of categories. So looking at you know some of them sort of pair up like Craig's Doors and Amherst Community Connections do sort of similar type work, literacy project and Center for New Americans do similar type work where we want to do one from each of those pairings rather than doing two from one and none from another. Yeah, I think that I'm I'm often in favor of that approach, and one of the reasons is when I do my rankings, um, you know, it's hard for me not to rank a kind of a you know homelessness or food pantry type program more highly um, because that's such a you know important human need you know compared to um, you know um, new Americans or literacy even though I think you know, they're both important, um, but also just the, the number of people that are served, for example, in a feeding program and food pantry is so much greater. And so it, it's hard not to rank the one higher than the other, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, it shouldn't be funded. Right. Right, and then you can, you know, obviously, I mean, what what those two pro programs do is enable people to get to a point where they're then able to be in the community working and buying food and and owning a home or renting a home. So it's you know it's it's all part of one. And I mean, one of the things I'm always so impressed by in reading the applications is how much work everybody does together and the partnerships among all the organizations and how much they value, I think, each other's place in the community. Um, and, and knowing that each one is there, you know, providing particular services. So if, um, if we were to um, go from here and say that we did want to think about, um, well, I guess actually, let me rephrase that. Does anybody have any questions left about any of the applications or anything they want to ask any of the organizations that are here. Um, I had, is there anybody here from Craig's Doors, Nate? Because one of the questions that, oh good, okay, Timothy McCarthy is here. I had, um, I was interested in that application and that it seemed that one of the things that they're looking to be funded is almost like an HR position, the compliance officer, um, which is not the kind of thing that we've usually funded. Um, so I don't know, can we bring Tim? Yeah, Tim, we can, you're going to be asked to become a panelist and then you can rejoin the meeting. I think I did it right. Can you, can you all hear me? We can see and hear you. Thanks for joining Tim. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. And, um, Becky, that's a, a super astute observation, and, and it's um, often the, the the title itself is a little bit misleading at times, and it, it's, it can be confusing internally as well. The focus of our compliance officer role um, is multidimensional. The the reality is that Craig's Doors has gone through a tremendous transition in the last year, and part of that is having to really build the professional infrastructure that is. Um, that was not uh, in place necessarily when the our new administration had taken over. And in that process, we'd realized that we were out of compliance in a variety of ways. Uh, and, and we've closed a lot of those gaps, but the gaps that we're really trying to focus on um, are the complex 
um, implementation of our own rules for guests and staff alike surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly surrounding um, the trans population right now. I don't know if folks are familiar, but gender nonconforming and trans individuals in shelters are particularly vulnerable. Um, and in terms of creating programs to support uh, and provide a sense of of safety and security in those spaces. It's really difficult because oftentimes it's a it's observed as a political issue. We observe it as a human rights issue, um, but not always do we have other guests who are on board. So that's one example of um, of our compliance process. And so it's really about us um, redesigning our mission surrounding the diversity, equity, and inclusion that needs to be the foundation of our philosophy and our service delivery simply because of the diverse population that we serve um, and and how those needs are sort of coexistent. There are components of the compliance um, officer role that are a little bit more, um, I guess, uh, not, I wouldn't even say bureaucratic, but it's a matter of aligning ourselves with HUD at the federal level and uh, DHCD at the state level to ensure that we are performing to the highest possible uh, alignment with their compliance regulation, I guess. So it's really a two factor consideration. One is ensuring that we can continue to function because we really took over a situation that was untenable, unsustainable. We're building out of that really effectively. In fact, um, with a, a, our reputation has gained a lot of momentum regionally, um, which is amazing and testament to the amazing team that we have. But it's also because of our focus on really getting where we need to be. Um, and then also recognizing the vision of who we want to be and, and what our organization represents. And um, we really do offer a safe space for folks who have had negative experiences in other facilities. Um, we operate from a, a, a real guest centric model. Um, and we're also the only low threshold uh, shelter in the region. In spite of that, we've still been able to see about 20% of uh, our guests being placed in permanent long-term housing because of our dedication to a, a more innovative and robust case management system, again, informed by the compliance officer role. So I don't wanna take up too much time. I hope that no, that was really kind of- helpful. And just um, while you're here, the other position that you were looking to have funded by the grant money was a case manager, is that right? Or a, it's, or um, a housing it's a, specialist? Exactly, yeah, housing navigator. So the, 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 um, popular, for lack of a better term, the prevailing uh, approach to to ending homelessness, cycles of homelessness right now is, is called the housing first model. And the idea is that you get folks into housing and then you provide them with all of the supports that they need to be successful. The problem is we don't have that luxury because there's just such a total lack of, um, of available housing to our guests. So in a lot of ways, we're creating a sense of home and building those independencies and, those, and helping them become autonomous through our program and while they're in it. But the objective is also to build relationships and systems that can help streamline the process of getting our folks uh, posted. And most importantly, by by being able to offer some um, graduated support. So one of the biggest heartbreaks that all of our agent, all agencies experience is that we make promises to landlords that this is going to be a supportive program and there's going to be a case management function and then most organizations drop off their guests there's no support it's unfair to the landlord the landlord grows sour to the idea of these programs that our guests benefit from and it becomes a a, a real um a negatively um what's the word i'm looking for it deteriorates really the relationship and, and the possibility and practicality of us getting folks in so the housing navigator is dedicated to building out our rapid rehousing and raft knowledge base creating um, basic systems of implementation forging relationships with landlords offering support after placement and um, developing databases that we can reference and ensure that we're providing the most effective uh the most efficient um, and effective strategies for trying to get our folks in it's, so you're it is a case management component it's sort of a specialist within that umbrella got it that's really helpful does anybody else have any other questions for tim well i was going to say tim i think some of it is you know other organizations apply for say a case management worker who you know who's the block grant funding is going directly to say a, a participant or beneficiary whereas a compliance officer that may be diluted whereas how much of their time is spending 
you know, providing services directly to a beneficiary or a program participant. And, you know, right now, the depending on how the committee makes recommendations, we might not be able to fund both positions. Um, and so then, you know, I saw in your budget, a lot of funding from DHCD is maybe already assigned to case managers. And it looks like block grant money is assigned to the housing navigator and also to the compliance piece um, um, position. And so, you know, is, I guess I guess that was, you know, Becky and I spoke earlier and it was that was kind of the question, you know, it was like how much um, is the, you know, the compliance person helping with making sure the beneficiaries are getting services or is it more of, as she said, kind of an organizational piece, and not a, you know, a direct benefit piece. Sure. I think that that's a, a totally fair question. Can you help me with the one, the, the clarification, Nate, you'd said case manager, funding case managers offers direct impact to service delivery? The way right, we so, and I had been talking about it was that one, you know, sort of the direct service, like actually dealing with clients. Okay, gotcha. Sure. Versus somebody who's sort of in the background. I mean, the idea, right, you think of a compliance officer at, you know, Again, yeah, the, the I, title. I understand that the yeah. title doesn't quite capture um, right. what that person actually, and it looks like you have that person already. Is that right? There's a person on the That's staff. right, yeah, they're they're actively, we're, yeah, they're, we, we couldn't afford to not have it, and for a few different reasons, and one of them, so uh, Nate, to, first of all, you're absolutely right. So it really, this is one of the struggles that we have. It's sort of, um, on the one hand, we have this immediate need, and these people who, who are trying to navigate a system that is incredibly broken and it's unbalanced and its advantages reflect the advantages that exist throughout any other layer of American culture. And so we have the response, I believe we have the responsibility and I think Amherst has really illustrated a commitment to this as well, that this big picture of creating the most in inviting, and, and the safest possible space uh, inevitably trickles down to the everyday experience, particularly of the most marginalized members of the folks that we do help. So we're already working with the most vulnerable members of society within that as a, as a further marginalized group. And so the role of the compliance officer is to create systems and opportunities to create, um, to, I'm, I'm sorry, identify necessary utilities to ensure that those folks are safe. So I, you're right in the sense that it, it's not necessarily as hand in hand uh, tangible as as the impact that a housing navigator might have. Um, but I would argue that it's actually it's got a, a, a greater and broader efficacy in terms of improving service delivery, including on the individual level, particularly if you're talking to someone uh, who is gender nonconforming. Um, or struggling with uh, their identity in any any capacity. So that sort of trauma informed care that comes along with the the um, our our compliance director. It's really ensuring that if anything, that role is making the largest impact on the entirety of the organization in a very practical way to the experience of the guests on on a day to day basis. I, again, I understand the language not only of the title, but some of the exp uh, explanation in the application may have, have led to a, a different understanding of the role. And frankly, it's evolved as it's been implemented, but that's where um, that's where we're seeing its greatest impact right now. So uh, to your point, it, it's not as tangibly impactful on a day-to-day, -day, but I think that it, it, it could have a broader impact, frankly, for the folks that it does have the most influence on. And so if you received just a, a a portion of your request, mm -hmm. would it go, how would that impact what you can do? I mean, would you not hire a housing navigator or it would just be about finding funding to pay for positions that are already there? Yeah, I think it, it would, inevitably we have to patch up what is already there, right? So we have to kind of catch up to what we've already invested in. Um, I, I don't think that we, we would just be so grateful, frankly, uh, for whatever can be committed. And we're going to doggedly pursue the funding that's required to be the organization that we want and need to be for our guests. I know that that's a very political answer and it's rather, it's pretty ambiguous. Um, but I, I mean, I, I really mean that. I don't know how else how else to, to speak to it. It goes without saying, we'd be thrilled to have the full ask, but um, any 
any uh, percentage would be would go towards us improving these capacities in one way or the other, whether it looks exactly like what we've spent this, you know, all of our strategy time planning out, which is, has been put in front of you guys. Um, we're hopeful and, and, and we're incredibly committed and dedicated. So we're going to find a way to make these things work. It's just if we could have it would afford us the opportunity to do so faster and and the the it is an exigent need it's a it's a very immediate need for the folks that stay with us now so again it, the the need for a housing navigator is implicit to the organization and the impact that we've been able to provide like i don't want to do a presentation i know but the the compliance officer so far has been able to go in meet with guests individually to ask of their experiences to get honest responses just an example guests are really afraid of um expressing uh any sort of grievance to our organization because historically they've been persecuted as a product of that so they would complain about some function of another organization and the next day for whatever reason they're they're being asked to leave our compliance officer was able to really dig that up, work with the guests to develop a guest informed policy uh, for grievance that ensures an uh, that ensures anonymity and is now resulting in a, a non retaliation policy that's going to be implemented later next week. That's just an example of how. Um, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Does please. anybody else have any other questions for Tim? My question was the same as, as yours, Becky. Also, in one of your responses um, to some of the questions that we asked along the way, um, you said that both positions are project oriented and will be redundant or unnecessary once the projects are complete. But these sounds like really necessary roles that yeah. should have some continuity. So I'm just wondering, okay. like, do you have a progression plan for these? Yeah. Sorry, I got excited because you're totally right. I will say when we wrote the <laughs> the request initially, we didn't recognize the scope of and how how incredibly important both roles could in the in the in the state of the um, the housing navigator, but much more so in the in the compliance role. So essentially, what we're doing is we're building out this foundation of policies that we have not had. And when I say a foundation of policies, I mean an employee handbook. I mean a curriculum of training. I'm talking about very basic institutional uh, components, infrastructural components that organizations should have. As we went along, we realized what a living dialogue and document this is, and so the role will be absorbed by our director of operations once we've been able to produce again that foundation that we can operate from and then we'll have quarterly reviews we'll have uh regular guest surveys based on their experience what they might change those will be put towards um a policy review committee which will be constituted both of guests and staff um to sort of review where we can improve um the guest participation is something that we're still working out we don't want to ever create an environment of apparent favoritism um but we certainly want the those folks engaged we've also really worked at um building a robust uh and diverse staff um constituted of everyone of every identity you can imagine but most importantly of what we're now calling lived expertise previously lived experience um and so that's super helpful in terms of keeping our eye on the ball and moving that forward the housing navigator role um is really about building out our our uh understanding of what has become an incredibly complex world of housing regulation and uh voucher availability so this is about um creating a knowledge base and again creating the systems creating the databases which again will also live so there will be an iteration of the housing navigator after the project is completed it'll look like our current model we have an outreach um case manager who works with people who are not able to stay with us um whether that's because they're voluntarily choosing not to, or we just don't have capacity, that's more common. It'll look similar to that, where it is a case manager who has a body of cases, but is working specifically with folks who are closer to housing or have a, a bit more of that capacity built, if that makes any sense. And then they'll be responsible for sort of navigating the platforms and systems um, that are developed by the current housing navigator role. Is that helpful? Again, I yeah. feel like I yeah. talk a whole lot. 
Sorry. No, Thank your you. passion is great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nat or Greg, do you have any questions? Greg, you good? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Great. I think we are good. Um, Tim, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, Truly. Thank you so, so much, guys. Okay. And I'll just come back on to join. Yeah, I'll um, yeah. change your role to an attendee. I think it just happens automatically. I don't. Sure I'm going to hit the button okay. right now. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. Yeah. All right. Have a good day. All right. Um, are there any other organizations that anybody wants to kind of dig deep into? Any questions from the applications? And let me know. I can share my screen again if we want to, to see the, the rankings at some point. Um, I, my other questions, actually, wait, let me, I just turned away. Did anybody have anything before I bring mine up again? Um, because my other questions actually were for sort of the similar organization for Amherst Community Connections around, um, because it also there looked like it was about staffing was the, um, and about bringing people on, um, to the recognition that volunteers, um, all right, it's a, it's tricky to run an organization on volunteers essentially that you don't have that continuity and and um, and what I was um, wanting to ask for some clarification on how many people could be hired, what the actual need is, and that. Um, so I guess if we can bring in Amherst Community Connection, I don't know who's here, but I do see that they're listed. Sure. Yeah. So Amherst Community Connections, you're being promoted to panelist, and then you can join the meeting. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, Thank you so much for having me here. Thank My name is Wei-Ling Greeny. Thanks, Wei-Ling. So um, we, um, I, were you here at the beginning? I didn't see, I couldn't see all the names up. Okay, so um, so we'll ask you some questions and, um, and dive in from there. Um, I was interested in, thank you for your proposal, first of all, and for your work. Um, I was, um, Noting that you, you know, the recognition that you you noted the um, the importance of of paid employees versus volunteers for stabilization and continuity of services, um, and I was wondering if you could go into a little more detail about what exact how many people you would you would ideally be bringing on as paid positions, um, and um, what you know full time, part time, what length of time, that sort of thing. Thank you, Becky, for the question. So uh, we have applied to the uh, CPA for a 12 voucher capacity to help families and individuals who are on the verge of becoming homeless because of their inability to pay rent or inability to pay utility. For those reasons, they are at risk of becoming homeless. So they are not homeless when they come to see us. That's the population we focus on. And we do have housing program for people who are already homeless. But for this position I'm looking at is, um, if we do get funded by the CPA for the 12 vouchers that we have applied, three years ago, we applied for six vouchers and we were granted for those six vouchers to help families or individuals at $400 a month for the time they need in order to become stabilized. So this time, because of the excellent track record we have established, 100% of the 17 families and individuals in those three years when they were with us, none of them became homeless because we were able to apply for tons and tons of financial assistance for them. So during the pandemic, when people lost income and are able, unable to pay rent, we were able to hold housing for them. So because of that track record, we realized there's a lot of needs in the community and our experiment worked well. So as a result, we want 12 vouchers. So in order to make that 12 vouchers work based on our experience, we feel we need to have a full-time person 
we could hire who will be providing weekly case management to these 12 families and individuals. On top of that, we continue to screen applicants who will benefit from this program, but we don't have the voucher for them. And the idea is to quickly graduate as fast as we can, stabilize those families and individuals, get to the extent that they can hold on to the housing so we can save that voucher for the next family and individuals. So we anticipate there will be another 12, if not more, families and individuals waiting in the wing will meet with us and ideally will be weekly, if not on a more regular basis. So to prevent them from falling into the homelessness while they are waiting for the voucher to get to them. So I would say the full-time person will be doing case management for upward of 24 families and individuals on a weekly basis. Okay, so I hope to have answered the question. And you've been granted the CPA funds for the 12 vouchers or you've applied for them? We have applied and uh, right now we are waiting to hear from them. But we have had very good, uh, really, uh, outcome when we apply for CPA money for the Housing First program years ago. We have received three fundings in the three different cycles for upward of six vouchers, three vouchers. And including the fourth one would be the CPA funding for the, uh, you know, the RSP, the rental subsidy program. So because of that good track record, we are confident that they will give us something. And I don't know how much, but if we don't get any, then we won't get any. <laughs> but our housing is tied to money and our services to help people stabilize. So even if we, we don't get the money for the uh, RSP rental subsidy program, Every year we have 500 or more of individuals, unique families, individuals come to seek help from us. So by having the tool, yes. Every year we do the um, C, CVBG, you know, we have to do the uh, statistics for them. So every quarter we submit a report to the CVBG for the report purpose. And in our case files, Right now, we are at the brim of about 700 plus. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So even if we don't get the funding, we know there's needs in the community. And our goal of helping people keep their housing, that's the most important thing. Because once you spiral downward into homelessness, it's so hard to get them back on. So prevention of homelessness is what we are striving for for this particular grant. Thank you. Matt or Greg, does either of you have a question? Okay, great. No. Thanks, Wei Ling. Thank you for your work and your time. Oh, wait, hold on, Greg just unmuted. Do you have a question? Oh, back to No, you. not for Wei Ling. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Well, that, um, those were all the questions that I had um, that came up while I was doing sort of the re-review. Um, so do, does anybody have any thoughts about how to proceed at this point and, or want to make any recommendation for what we should do going forward? And I guess- So the I yellow, just quickly, the yellow is what, you know, was, originally discussed in terms of having a, you know, a, have, taking the average of the preliminary recommendations and just going down in order. And I don't know if that, you know, if you want to start there and maybe if, if some of those still look like they'd be some of the five that would be funded and we could just then, you know, the committee can then discuss the others, you know, so if we just went down the list, there's family outreach. If that's, you know, a consensus, yes, maybe we just, you know, we can say that and then, you know, kind of work our way down if that, is helpful. Sure. Why don't we 
start with that and knowing that we can go back if necessary, but but generally in terms of the rankings, um, yeah. So would people include family outreach in the final five? I guess we'll just nod if we see that. Yes. Uh, I have yeah. a question before uh, we go uh, any any further. Great. Uh, just a clarification for me. Is that okay? Of course. Yeah. Uh, I was looking when, when I did the ranking. I was looking at the uh, community development strategy along with the survey of priorities um, and uh, housing is. Uh, uh, a high priority, if not the number one priority on the survey, a high priority uh, for the town uh, in, in most of these assessments. Uh, my question is, uh, historically, I don't have, you know, this is my first year, so I don't have the history to know uh, what happens. Housing, as I recall, 10 years ago was a priority. Um, so in terms of other needs, that are around here, um, economic, food, nutrition, um, which are lower on the survey and the priority list. It's not a lower concern, but just in terms of the list. Uh, for, for the most part, I, I uh, gave a lot of weight to the priority in terms of uh, the community assessments of its needs uh, and try to uh, stay close to that in terms of the, the first run through. And I was wondering, does the priority shift much? Okay, if, for instance, if I'm thinking that housing stabilization is the top priority and it becomes a top priority for a number of different years, uh, how do we keep some sort of balance for the other needs that are also important, uh, but doesn't uh, fall higher on the list? Uh, so how, how have we done that historically? Yeah, that's a really good question. The committees, you know, from year to year has had that discussion. Would, for instance, um, you know, two years ago, they were saying, you know, right, we, if we have five priorities every year, housing, food, um, homelessness, you know, then how does it help um, with decision makings or, you know, getting rankings? And usually the committee would say, well, what we, you know, unfortunately, we're not, we can't fund our way out of these priorities. And so they continue to be community priorities. So the one way to change it is, and some communities will say that their priority one year might be food insecurity and that's it. And you know, it, maybe it isn't housing, maybe it isn't mental health services or whatever it is. They really used to say it's food and maybe, you know, and then they really will recommend funding a food pantry or food services and the next year they might rotate it to housing and the next year they might rotate it, rotate it to something else. And um, I think the difficulty in Amherst is we have a, a really robust network of service organizations. And so we have identified needs and they don't really go away, right? And so, um, you know, for instance, if, you know, uh, you know I'll, I'll say, you know, Tim is really enthusiastic and say in five years, Craig's Doors is doing amazing things and they have a lot of funding they might not apply for block grant funding because, you know, they've become such a big program and they're, you know, we have housing in town and they're meeting needs. And so maybe then the need might still be there. Maybe it's not as much of a priority and they're not applying, but, you know, the thing is we're not seeing that. Right. So um, what we've actually heard from social services is, is typically if you actually get more funding and the program grows, the need grows because the needs is there but people might be reluctant to use it. But if they, you know, if the program somehow can do more outreach, they actually have more people. And so uh, a few years ago, we, we did ask that of organizations and they said that, you know, if we, if we grow, there's almost no shortage of need. And so it doesn't make it easier. And so, yeah, so the committee from year to year has said, well, do we actually then weight the priorities differently year to year? That would then be, you know, translate into how the proposals are reviewed. And it's never been, that's never been the decision to do that. It's always been to say, we can have a few priorities and then that encourages different types of proposals. And then we'll just go through and rank the proposals. Um, so, you know, yeah. So I think what Nat had said though earlier, is sometimes if you get proposals that may be similar, uh, would you, would the committee recommend funding one proposal and then try to hit proposals 
recommend proposals that hit different uh, priority needs, right? So maybe one will fu be funding food, one might be funding housing and, and so forth. And so that's how you might go about making recommendations. Um, you know, and some of it is if there's a need in the community, the, com the strategy identifies needs in the community, whether or not they're block grant eligible. And so it may be that there may be uh, priorities and needs in the community, but there's just no organization that's meeting those and we don't get those proposals for block grant, a block grant uh, activity. And so, you know, economic, so you know, we have Valley CDC for microenterprise assistance, but, you know, a few years ago, we didn't have those proposals. So even if we identified, you know, small business assistance, for instance, um, if we hadn't, if there wasn't a program that was operational, they just weren't applying for it because, you know, even though the need, the needs been identified, there isn't an activity that's set up to meet it or has a capacity to get block grant funding. And so uh, the committee had said, well, let's keep the strategy broad as well and really focus on those needs. And hopefully that encourages uh, brainstorming or creativity and somehow we'll get maybe proposals that we hadn't anticipated. Um, you know, because the ones we have here are, you know, we typically see eight to 10, uh, eight to 12 proposals every year and they're similar organizations. Um, it doesn't make it easier for this year, but that's kind of been the, the history. But I think, Greg, your question really brings up sort of what I was saying earlier is that, you know, being in the position of trying to decide whether food is more important than housing is, it's really difficult <laughs> to try mm -hmm. to make those assessments. And um, so I think, you know, where we're at is, you know, having, um, you know, decided that we're going to do five organizations, which is our, the tradition of this committee. And I mean, we could decide to just do one, but I think that's, uh, you know, or two and, and give all the, you know, much larger amounts to a smaller number of organizations. That hasn't been how we've traditionally done it. And it's, I think, not what the town manager would be expecting from this committee, because there are so many different kinds of needs in the community. Um, and so for us, it's making that hard, those hard decisions about the priorities, you know, and yes, housing stabilization is at the top of that list, but, you know, how do you actually rank it next to food insecurity? Um, Thank you. So do, I guess the, I'll just say, you know, from my perspective, looking at the, at the list in yellow, um, you know, I am, I think I'm sort of inclined to say that we should, um, that it makes sense to fund organizations that are doing different kinds of work, um, you know, and to to not like to to have Center for New Americans or Literacy Project be, you know, which is representing the adult education um, sector, to have one of those rather than who, having it all go toward housing stabilization and and homelessness. Um, I could be. I could really make an argument for for either side, but it, it does seem to me to make some sense to do that. Um, but I, so I guess I'm curious what other people think. Yeah, I, I, I guess I agree, and and that's kind of, um, I think that the last cycle we kind of had a similar question, and we ended up only funding one of them. And last time I believe it was the um, literacy project, and not Center for New Americans. I think it switched. I think last time we did Center for New Americans. I think it was the Literacy Project. Is it? Oh, okay. Oh, Lori. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, at this. Oh, um, you know what? Yes, I think you're, if you're looking at it, then you're right. I think you're right. Yeah, that was the uh, okay. 20, 2021. I think this was from, maybe this was from uh, Ben, not Nate, but I, I assume that, that Ben would be just as diligent as Nate. In that. Yes. <laughs> so yes. Okay. So um, right. So last time we did Center for New America, we did a literacy project and um, the and Amherst Community Connections. I think is that right? As the right. right. So if we were to think about you know spreading the support, then it would be this year doing Center for New Americans and Craig Stores potentially. Um, as you know, if we wanted to, I mean, I don't know. These are really hard decisions. Yeah. And I, I feel a bit bad about you know the senior center proposal. I was glad that we received that and it's kind of a first time and it's something that that we had identified as a need even you know a few years ago. 
Um, and this is the first time we got a proposal for it. So it's, it's, you know, tough for me to say, well, we really can't fit them in into the five um, grantees this year. But, but unfortunately, I think that's kind of the way the numbers are stacking up. So um, why don't we go through this list then, I guess, and, and just sort of see if we have consensus. Um, so family outreach, um, which really fills its own category. I don't think there's anything else that's quite quite the same as what they do um, in terms of having a, you know, choosing between family outreach and another similar type of organization. Um, and our people... But we can just say that this would be one of the five for now. And I'm, I'm, I'm typing right here down the list okay. if that's visible for yeah. everyone. And then, so then the know. Survival Center, which obviously also does, I mean, similarly sort of is, is fills one particular need um, and is the only organization that does that in, in town. Um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, which is the only proposal we got that focuses on children. Or youth, youth development. Youth development. Um, and... And then I think we, then we're down to the the choices. Um, and does, I was really um, I thought that um, Tim's explanation about what they're doing with those positions is um, was really interesting to hear, and I think it's. Um, I was really impressed by how forward thinking and inclusive, I mean, I've always been impressed by the inclusivity of, of Craig stores and what they do. And um, I, I was really impressed by, by his explanation tonight, going into a little more detail about what those positions do. Um, I didn't really understand that as, as when I was reading through them. Yeah, I thought it was a, um, you know, I'm impressed by how much work they're putting into this um, kind of repositioning of what they do. And it's a lot of work. And what we're being asked to fund is maybe just one small part of it. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd love to be supportive of everything that they're doing, um, even if they're only asking for uh, um, us to fund one small part of it. So I put Craig's doors. Sorry. All right, go ahead, Nate. I was gonna say, should I should I type down Craig's doors here? Let's just... hear what Suzanne's gonna say, and then we'll. Well, I was just gonna say, based on our on our rankings, if we were to assign values to them, I think Craig's doors was not tied with Amherst Community Connections. It did have, um, the value would have been, um, it would have been a higher ranking overall based on everybody's um, ratings. Mm -hmm. Greg, what are your thoughts on Craig's doors? Let me see. And I should just say, I guess, just for the audience members that we do have two committee members who couldn't be here tonight, um, but who did give us their ranking. So um, we're... Um, which is why it is especially important for us to look at those rankings and, and at the weight of, the, of their votes. Yeah, I did list uh, uh, Craig's door as one of the, uh, the top five that I had. Um, but one of, the, one of the concerns that I have is uh, to have an understanding of whether uh, since, you know, I, I think in terms of prioritizing, uh, a lot of these programs are so close and they all do good work. Uh, and this is, I guess, a general question for the folks that are here today. But uh, is there any program that if they don't get funding, uh, they have to, they'll be around, but they'll have to shift and not do that particular uh, or provide a particular service or particular task won't be done. Uh, and I was just wondering, is there, uh, is there any program that's concerned about uh, if they don't get funding, what they're going to be doing? 
uh, it seems like most programs can shift a little uh, and, and make things work, but uh, uh, you know that that's one of my concerns. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. A few years ago, we had the committee had this question or similar question, and it was that, and it may come up tonight. You know, depending on what we recommend, what's the minimum amount that a committee would want to be funded? Because if it's if they're seeking a full time position and the recommendation is only something that could be half time, is that you know can they make up the difference to still have a full time position or not? For instance, and. Um, yeah, I mean, when I read through the proposals, look at the budget, I feel like most organizations would, you know, maybe they have to scale back a little bit or uh, shift funding, or they might have to try to then kick up some fundraising, right? And I don't know that something wouldn't happen. I feel like maybe it would maybe it'd be delayed or in a much, a much smaller scale, right? So, um, you know, it's hard to quantify that uh, exactly. But, you know, for instance, if we only fund family outreach at, 30,000, they might say, well, we can't do exactly what we're going to do the same thing we said we're going to do, but on a scaled down version, right? We'll do a third of what we thought we we're going to do. Um, yeah, I think another another way to look at this, Greg, I think in the past when we've asked, and I think Tim gave a similar answer today, when we've asked in the past, you know, what would happen if we could only give you a smaller amount? Is it still, you know, worth doing? Um, I don't think any organization has ever told us, well, then don't bother. Um, I think everyone has always said, you know, whatever you think you can fund, we'll be grateful to accept and we'll, you know, work from there. I don't think anyone has ever you know, turned down a, a smaller amount. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're, you're right. I don't think they have. Yeah. Or, or with Craig doors, Craig's doors, for example, if we, you know, were looked at the funding request between the housing navigator and the compliance officer, well, you know, maybe we could make a decision that way about. Right, the committee could recommend with a condition or a, you know another contingency that the funding go as much toward one position over the other or something, you know, similar to what you did with the town's proposal. So it could be that, you know, it's then the town manager's decision, but really it shows some of the committee's um, thinking that, you know, so typically uh, when the recommendations go to the town manager, there's also a memo that summarizes this discussion so then they can, the town manager can understand, you know, some of the, you know, some of the thoughts that were presented and considerations that went into the recommendations. So we have the three right now, and I don't, I mean, do I type in Craig's doors as the four? Well, I guess, well, so here's what I guess I would say is, is I think maybe the thing to do is to decide sort of big picture. Do we want, are we in agreement that, um, that we should pick one adult education program and one program that works with the houseless. And so then we're choosing between, you know, the two sets of two. Um, are we so if we're in agreement there, then that will guide the discussion after. So um, I know Nat said he he felt that that was the the correct way to go. Suzanne and Greg, what are your thoughts on that? Versus so funding. we'd be choosing between what and what between so be Center for New Americans, choosing between Craig's Doors and Amherst Community Connections for one okay. spot of the five, and then between Literacy Project and Center for New Americans for the other spot of the five. Versus, um, you know, if you look at what our rankings were, um, where. None, neither of the adult education programs ended right. up in our top five. So if we went straight through the rankings, we would do both Craig's doors and um, Amherst right. Community Connections. Well, that's a tough one. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and also just to, yeah. to note, as I just said, right, we have two members who aren't here. So all we, all, the only voice we have from them um, is the ranking the rankings. I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking also, but uh, what what are the, again, the two uh, programs that we're uh, trying to decide on? Well, we were, so we're deciding on, right, we have two spaces left in our group of five, and it's deciding whether 
we would do, if we followed the rankings, it would be the two organizations, it would be Amherst Community Connections and Craig's Doors, both of which work with the homeless population. If we decided that we wanted to um, give monies to two different types of organizations or organizations doing different kinds of work, it would be choosing between Craig's Doors and Amherst Community Connections for one of those spots. And for the other spot, choosing between um, Literacy Project and Center for New Americans. And which is not to say, just to be clear, like we, I think we all understand that all those organizations do different work and work distinctly in, in their own ways. Um, and we're making the groupings just because of the category, really not because they're, they're the same. And uh, the second category was for adult education. Is that what you were saying? Exactly. Yep. So Center for New Americans and the Literacy Project. So under the priority of economic self-sufficiency. Right. Thank you. Yes, that's yeah. Right. Um, right. Okay. I have a question. Uh, in our forms, uh, one of the activity areas, I believe, was transportation service mm -hmm. and support. That is in the category, senior support, that is in the category that uh, we've talked about today. Uh, the reason I bring it up is because there's other uh programs that we talked about that are in six seven and eight uh and have uh more people choosing them uh, placing them in six seven and eight than uh the senior center so why would we pull one out and not the other for a comparison based just based on our ranking So I think I feel like we should go by the rankings that Suzanne and Matt did over mine because mine was flawed. Um, but I think the senior center ranked eighth. Is that right? Right. right. That in the rankings. Right. So that's why we haven't discussed it in the same way, but obviously we can. Okay. Uh so you're saying that the ranking may not be accurate. No, no, no. I think the ranking the is accurate. My ranking was inaccurate. When I did my own counting, because I'm just okay. terrible with numbers, no matter what, um, I um, miscounted myself. So I was just saying, use Nat and Suzanne, who both are excellent with numbers, um, did their own weight, weight of and ranking, and Senior Center for both of theirs ended up ranking last by the votes. Right. So if you looked at the individual, you know, oh, rankings, the senior center was, you know, half the committee had them as their lowest lowest ranking. Right. And the others were lower than five, except for maybe one. So it was just they were, you know, they were the lowest ranked proposal, as Becky said. So it just hasn't been discussed yet. If we if we can only fund five, you know, does that one then leapfrog up? to a fifth, you know, the fifth ranking when there's still a few others ahead of that in the overall priority list. So I, I think that's right. Okay. Yep. But right, it is a good question. And, you know, I, I think the comparative review is, uh, you know, as Nat said, it's not the definitive necessarily that, you know, that yellow list is not necessarily the recommendations is what the review kind of showed. And so, you know, if through discussions tonight, you know, we reorganize, that's fine. I just, um, you know, we still have a few more to talk about. Another thing that we had talked about, we or have talked about before is, um, you know, the importance of not um, of ha not having organizations rely on community development block grant monies. And so mm -hmm. to really think about spreading, going to different organizations to, in different years um, where possible um, so that we are, are really 
and you know funding as um, throughout the community and not just having certain organizations just be able to sort of count on always getting CDBG monies. Um, and this is an unusual year also because it's a two year period. So organizations that have typically gotten money, if they don't this year, it'll be a two year period where they're not getting CDBG funds um, before they can apply again. Um, so, you know, just as we're thinking about, you know, if we do decide to do the choosing between those categories, you know, choosing one organization in each of those categories to think about um, picking ones that we hadn't picked before um, or whether that impacts, you know, who's in the top five at all. Um, and I just have a clarification question. So for Center for New Americans on our ranking chart um, that we use to evaluate the and the funding request from the proposal, I think for Center for New, Numer New Americans, it was forty thousand dollars. Yeah, the um, right. No, sorry, that was a. It is forty thousand. Okay, I just want to make sure. Thank you. Um. Um, well, so I guess just to, I will just make a recommendation of what I think the five should be just to get us started as a, <laughs> so I, my recommendation would be that we fund the three that are written here, Family Outreach, Survival Center, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and then I would add in there Center for New Americans and Craig's Doors and how the five this year or for the next two years would be those. Yeah. All right, and then uh... yeah, I I like that because I think um, on the one hand, um, you know, we the previous cycle we had funded um, literacy project and not Center for New Americans, so I like you know going back to uh, give them funding and. Uh, so I think, you know, I'm not sure what the amounts are, but but in terms of the five finalists for funding, um, I think that looks like a sensible group to me. Did Craig Stores receive funding in the last cycle? No, they haven't been funded um, in a while. So, you know, years ago, we funded the operation of the shelter, and then it's been, um, they haven't received block grant funding in a number of years. Okay. They, did, they did apply. Um, periodically for certain funding, but they haven't been recommended okay. or received it in a while yet. Last year, I do recall we had an extensive conversation kind of going back and forth between community, Amherst Community Corrections and Craig's Doors. Mm -hmm. I think I would agree with your, your ranking, Becky. Were those For those five. Right, so then the ones that wouldn't receive funding are here. Amherst Community Connections, the Literacy Project, and the Senior Center. Right. And so, Greg, what do you think about that as the list? Uh, it's pretty much really close to what I. Uh, recommended in the first place. You know, there may be a different order, but the top five, uh, there's four of them. And uh, <clears throat> looking at the proposal for uh, the center uh, in the categories that we were talking about, uh, I, I think that's a, a good choice. Uh, you know, if we can't fund everybody, which we can't. Uh, and uh, they didn't have the opportunity the last time through. I, I would uh, uh, agree to uh, recommend uh, that they be placed in the top five, the center that is. Okay, great. Um, okay, so having achieved some consensus there, we haven't taken an official vote, but I think then um, I would now say that if there are any participants here um, who, want to share something that's not in your proposal or something that you think we haven't understood, um, you know, now would be the time. I'm cognizant, I'm just looking at the 
actual time. So it's still, the night is still a little bit young. Um, and so if there is anybody who wants to share anything, um, I would invite you to, to raise your hand. Um, looks like Haley Bolton. So yeah, I'll be right in a second. I'm just reorganizing this for now and then we'll, okay. we can call on, um, you want to allow Haley to become a panelist, Becky? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Haley, you should be asked to become a panelist and then you can rejoin. Hey. Hi, Haley. How's it going? Um, yeah, so do you want me to wait until you're done, Nate? Uh, no, I'll, I'm, I'm done, so that way it's not confusing. Okay. okay. Um, I wanted to first just share a comment that as a first time applicant, it was very intimidating going up against some of these, um, you know, these established organizations that have a, a great history with the CDBG committee. Um, but one of the things I don't know that I really got across in my application is that this is more than just transportation. It's more than I'm just- I'm gonna interrupt you for one sec, just to oh, say, sure. clarify. So you did the senior center? Yes, that's right. Uh, yes, I don't know um, if we've met, I'm the senior center director. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so it goes beyond transportation. Um, the ability for the senior center to book rides, um, it not only provides a way for individuals to get to needed appointments, it also provides a wellness check. Um, so some of you may know, some of you may not, but when you are socially isolated, your risk of um, developing or having dementia symptoms worsen increases by 50%. And that certainly has been exacerbated by the pandemic. So if we have a tool through this van to give rides to older adults, that gives us a set of eyes on the person, gives us an opportunity to say, hey, you know, we noticed that Mrs. Smith is a little bit more disoriented recently. She's not remembering where she's supposed to be. She's canceling rides. We can have our social worker follow up with that person and refer them to services. Or we can say, hey, this person didn't show up for their ride and they're always consistent. Let's give them a call. Let's make sure that they're okay. Um, so it really goes beyond just giving a ride. Um, it's a, a way to engage with our older adults and help them age in place, um, which is, you know, transportation and support services for seniors were two of the stated goals. Um, and also just in case anyone's not aware, um, seniors, people over the age of 60 are 52% of the population. And that number um, will grow by about 17% over the next five years. So it's really time to start investing in our older adults. It's time to start giving them more support services because we are reaching a point where older adults outnumber uh, people under 18 by five to one. That's a pretty um, statistically significant number. And there's no time like the present to start working on that and creating some infrastructure to help our older adults stay in the community. Um, I hear all the time from people, I've paid taxes for 40 years and I can't get a ride to my doctor's office. Something seems wrong about that. Um, and that's what we're trying to do through the Silver Shuttle is give people a way to be independent, stay in, um, stay in their homes longer. And, and I don't know um, if that really came across as clearly as, as I feel it in my application. So I, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to just say a few words. Oh, thank you for that. I, I didn't get that from your application, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, can I ask, I um, I know that the Dial-A-Ride program, mm -hmm. or I think, I believe that it has expanded recently, and I'm wondering whether there are other van programs that serve that same purpose and you're looking to expand it, or whether because they're not directly connected to the senior center, it doesn't quite meet that need. Sure. Um, so we conducted a livability service as part um, survey as part of the Agent Dementia Friendly Project. And what we found is that people are still needing more transportation options. I think the dial a ride has been helpful, but there are still people who are isolated and fragmented. Um, I know I have one individual, she's 86. She loves coming to the senior center. She loves playing cards and getting to chat with the staff. And a lot of times she doesn't have a way to get home. Like we have to walk her home. She uses a walker, she's very frail. If we had a van, that's somebody that I can say, hey, we don't need to walk you to your apartment. We'll just give you a lift. And it's, it's so much easier and so much safer for that person. You know, it gets very icy um, in the winter time. So 
I understand that that's um, the PVTA provides a really valuable service, but it's not meeting enough. You know, again, there's 5,200 older adults. They, they can't all take um, the, the PVTA and our van is ADA compliant. So we can take people who have walkers. We can take people who are in a wheelchair, um, which there, there are not a lot of services that offer that. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Haley? And actually, let me, I just want to respond to your initial comment about mm -hmm. sort of feeling intimidated about yes. the, um, that the work, first of all, just to say that the work you do is, is as essential in the community as, as any. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and, um, and I hope, you know, that, you know, depending what happens tonight, but I hope you will continue to apply and, and not be intimidated by the process and know that we absolutely reviewed your application as seriously as any of the other ones. Um, and we love when new organizations do apply or, or I mean, senior centers has, has maybe applied in the past as before I was even on it, but um, it is, it's great to get new applications and see the amazing work that's happening in town. And, um, and I really appreciate that, that you're here tonight and, and the extra comments that you made tonight. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think it was just first time nerves. Um, so yeah, so thank you again for this opportunity. All right, take care and thank you for your yeah, time. Thanks. Harry, I'll make you an attendee again if there's other questions. Okay. All right, thanks. I can share my screen again for everyone and the, um, you know, I don't, you know, so the, I've reorganized the proposals here uh, with the funding to match what was here. And so if that's still the order the committee likes, we, I, you know, the next decision is, is the budgetary one. Um, you know, so just, you know, just a reminder, we have 330,000, the five organizations we've recommended um, is a bit more than that. So, um, you know, at some point we have to figure out how to allocate the budgets for each each request. So let me first ask just whether um, hearing Haley sort of additional information about the program, whether that um, changes anybody's thoughts about what we should do. Um, and um, I, I think it just it just underscores how difficult this process is when we can only choose five and they're all very worthy of funding and and I can't fault any of them you know for what they're trying to do and and I can commend them for their efforts and so it's it's just always tough to take eight really strong applications and narrow it down to five I agree yeah I agree with that yeah yeah and whether or not it's a consolation Haley typically you know some organizations apply for a few years and don't get funded until you know, we can, you know, staff, we often say we can follow up with organizations to help, um, you know, relay comments or I, you know, have ideas where applications can be strengthened, proposals can be strengthened the following year. So I think that's something, as Becky said, you know, we can continue to apply, uh, you know, you can continue to apply for the, you know, the next year or two. And so, um, you know, that often happens where the first year it may not be recommended and it might just be that it, you know, uh, as Nat said, it's really competitive. And so it's just a matter of, um, you know, getting in, um, you know, there are some follow-up questions the committee had. And so then it's just, you know, how, how can we, how can, you know, the proposal be strengthened for next year? Um, so can, Nate, can you, is it possible to, as we're doing the numbers, remove the three that we're not looking at right now, just to see what the total is of just the, Sure. Let me just, uh, I can sum that up. Uh, sorry. Why is that not summing up right? Should be 450, 453, 440. Yeah. I think the, the others might be text. Are they text? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I copied this from the website. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, well, I forgot what that one was. Um, 115.400, I think yeah. it is. Oh, yeah, there we are. Yeah, I think it was just the right, the formatting. Yeah. 
I think I think um, it's a small amount, but it was 115,440, I believe. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's always funny when you get down to the dollars and cents on a proposal like this. So I'm glad we ended it at uh, 40, <laughs> not, you know, 442, 37 or something. <laughs> All right, so Matt, this is when you work your magic and you figure out if we gave everybody the same percentage of their ass, how do we get to 30? <laughs> yep, so that's, so that's like about, thing. yeah, that, that's about 73%. So maybe if, if Nate wants to put these down just as a starting point so you can see what it looks like if it's all pro rata. Yeah, sure, so, it'll be in this, it'll be in this um, column here, yeah. Okay, so this is just, if it's pro rata, it's um, 56,766, 101,888, 58,222, 84,014. That would be for Craig's doors. Oh. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> we just keep Center oh, for I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Boost. Yeah. We Center give them for, a boost. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Center for New Americans would be uh, 29,111. So with rounding, I'm not sure if it comes out to exactly the same. Yeah. There's, with rounding, there's $1 extra that we can make that work. Yeah. But so that gives you an idea of what, if everyone has reduced pro rata, what it looks like. Yeah, and so you know, in the years past, sometimes we have two recommend. You know, we have might have another way to do it, and so we could have two columns next to each other, right. um, just as a, you know, another. So in in years past, would you, or not in years past, even if we want if we wanted to entertain, would we, kind of assign weight based on our rankings again going back to the rankings so say family outreach of Amherst had you know whatever say five percentage points above any other would we weight that higher and give them a higher percentage so say instead of whatever 73 percent we assign them 90 percent um would that be another way to do it I mean it would make the numbers a little bit uh, yeah. that's definitely something we trickier to calculate yeah <laughs> yeah no, but in the years past that has been one strategy because you know taking um as nat did a, a you know a proportional amount it could just be that if someone asks for more they get more whether or not yeah. the review is stronger and so yeah i think yeah. this becomes a discussion point again you know um you know we also talk about you know say center for new americans or if an organization isn't asking for a lot you know could we fund them fully you know, what does that mean? And, you know, sometimes it's about how does it, how is the funding request uh, fit into their overall other, you know, their program budget? Um, you know, is it, how is it um, in terms of what is it funding? Is it a position? Is it um, a certain service that can be, um, you know, proportionally reduced easier? And so those, that, that becomes all something that's considered. It's not really a straight line formula. I mean, it can be, you know, this could work if, if the committee likes this and it, you know, it's a rational approach. And it could be that, well, right, maybe you'd say, well, maybe we just move it around a little bit because of the way the rankings, the, you know, the weighted rankings uh, were. And another thing, and, and I think one of your kind of main points, that one of the issues I have with this is that it does sort of reward an organization that asks for, you know, a whole lot more. The other kind of data point I sort of look to and, you know, take it with a grain of salt, I guess, but um and if we funded them in the past how does this compare with previous funding so that's for example, what i was just gonna say yeah so, <laughs> so i was looking at too yeah so for example family outreach for the single year we funded 36.5 so that would be for two years would be what's um 73 yeah yeah and so um so this amount would be you know, quite a bit lower than what we funded them in the past for family outreach. Did you say 72? Yeah, uh, well, um, um, 73, 73, I think. 73. Yeah, 73. yeah, 73. So if you took their one year of funding at 36.5 in the last cycle and funded that for two years, it'd be 73,000. So 
I, cause I, I was looking at that too, Nat, but like the, you know, the survival center, it was 51, 100 in the last cycle. Right. So you're close to that. Um, but that right. doesn't necessarily mean that we would just because that's what we funded last time, we should get as close as we can to that. And even though the new request was around the same or more. Right. Right. I mean, if you took the, you know, the, the available funding and, you know, divided by five, then, you know, you're, you know, you know, at 65,000 and it may, you know, or whatever it is, then maybe that the proposals come in and it works out really nicely that everyone gets around that amount, but then it, you know, it doesn't, right. So <laughs> it's not that everyone, you can get, you know, the committee or the, you know, we didn't, we haven't ever said that, you know, that we would just divide it equally. I mean, there could be, we could do that. It's just, it becomes something well, that it's not then. If we did that though, right, we'd end up with a surplus because that would have to go to right. someone and which could, maybe that's where the rankings would come in as we'd say, okay, everybody right. gets the same amount, but because Center for New Americans is asking for less, their extra goes to the first the organization that received the most votes being family outreach. Right. Yeah, and I guess looking at these numbers, I'm I'm just the the pro rata amounts. I'm you know my my instinct is that while I applaud Craig's doors for all that they're doing and their their you know um, really ambitious proposal, um, I'm looking at that eighty four thousand figure and just wondering whether that's a bit out of proportion compared to how we funded the other programs in the past. So my my instinct looking at the past um, grant cycles is that this pro rata has family outreach, for example, kind of too low and maybe has the Craig's doors amount too high. Do you want, I mean, I came up with some numbers, I don't know. I mean, they're not as mathematically applicable as what you did now, but I don't know if you want to try these out. Sure. Um, so for family outreach, I had 70,000 survival center, a hundred thousand big brother, 60,000 new Americans, 25,000 and Craig's door, 75,000. And that gets to three thirty, I think. And where did you come up with those? Like what was so I looked at what I kind of looked at what they had been funded for in the past for those that had been funded in the in the past and for what they were requesting. So as I said, it wasn't really as mathematical in nature. It was more just assigning based on our rankings, what they requested, what they also received. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and then I just had to knock down some of the numbers a little bit to get to the 330. Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, obviously this is just, this is just my idea of what I wrote down. So, you know, any of these I think could be bumped up or down. Yeah. But I, I like, you know, compared to the sort of just mathematical pro rata allocation, um, I think your round numbers there are closer to what I think is, you know, a good allocation. Yeah, I like how I, I like them as well. I'm I'm wondering whether, you know, something like the Center for New Americans, which I know now this puts all of our rankings sort of out, out the window, but um, places, and maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like if they're asking for, for so much significantly less than anybody else is, um, because it's a smaller organization, whether getting less means more to them than a larger organization getting less, um, and whether giving them closer to the full amount that they've asked for is more impactful for them than it is for some of the larger organizations. Like to bump them up to, you know, say 35 
Mm -hmm. take 10 away from, you know, five away from each of five and five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From family outreach and Amherst survival center. Um, whether it's that much more impactful for center for new Americans because of their smaller budget. Yeah, I guess I, I would have thought if, if I were to kind of tweak these, I might, um, increase Center for New Americans a bit and reduce Craig's doors. Um, I know it doesn't make that much difference. It doesn't move the needle that much, but but Survival Center, just knowing that we've funded their single year food pantry at 51, I would love to go 102 instead of 100, even though it's, yeah. it's, it's a um, very marginal difference. But to me, somehow that feels like, you know, we're not you know, reducing our support for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the first number I had for them was 102. And I that's where I was playing with bringing it down to get to the 330. But I think um, I think that makes sense too. All right, so if we did then 102. To so we'll, survival. To survival. So we'll do a third column here just for fun. <laughs> because we can. <laughs> right. Because that cell goes on forever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was looking at the budgets for each, you know, so what um, I was trying to quickly, you know, what Craig's doors, say, for instance, was asking for one position, you know, 75,000 would cover it, for instance, you know, over the grant period and, you know, would, um, you know, how does it work for the other organizations? And, you know, I, I, as, as Nat said, no one's ever turned it down, but it's nice to know that if we're getting close to, say, what could be a, a, a you know, a nice amount or an amount that works with the budget. Um, well, for Craig's stores, I mean, if we looked at their budget right there, for the housing navigator, that's 71,760. Right. And the compliance officer was 43,680. So if we brought that down to like 72,000, mm-hmm. then you can, you have 3,000 to play with. So I like the idea of doing that. I also, though, I I don't, I'm not inclined to dictate how the money gets used. Yeah, true. But I think it's fine to do that, but but not to necessarily say you must spend it on. Not to dictate, but to use that as a guideline in coming up with a number. Exactly. Right, right. For instance, if we were changing something, um, you know, it's kind of an ask, like, oh, what happens if they receive less? Like, oh, all of a sudden, you know, say, for instance, we were, Center of New Americans was getting so little, it's like, oh, they, you know, it really, they lose the, a teacher position or something. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that's happening, but right, for instance, if that was the case, I think their budget was a little, um, you know, the block grant money helped in a number, a number of different areas in their, um, their activity budget, you know, line item. So um, I don't know. So where, where are we going? So if we're doing so, a- So why don't we do, let's try this. If we put in for the Survival Center 102, Sorry, 102. And then for Craig's doors, 72. And then I just pulled up the Center for New Americans budget um, just to see if there's any sort of number that makes sense. Um, We could look at their Hmm. I mean, it's such a bare bones budget. Yeah. You know, that it, um, Thirty-five, and then we do the rest. What do we, 
So we'd have 9,000 to take from the other two. Okay. Right, and it could be, I mean, yeah, yeah. As I was gonna say, you know, do we keep Saralson at 100 or Craig's doors at 70 and have a round number? I don't. Mm -hmm. Does that make it much easier for you? <laughs> Not necessarily. <Okay. laughs> Because the 102 and 72 are sort of with reasons behind them, even though the numbers aren't right. Right, right. We could just. But if we were using that same methodology as maintaining, like Survival Center for maintaining the 51 100 or close to what they received previously, then we would want to do the same for family outreach, which would be 73,000. Mm -hmm. So then we're, you know. Okay. Well, that actually could work maybe, right? Because then Big Brothers, if we did 58, that would be over. Or 48, 48. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, 48. But because Big Brothers was funded at 29,200 previously. Right, so yeah, so here I just threw in 48 if we kept you know, those numbers. Well, so we could then go to maybe 30 for instead of 35 for Center for New Americans and then bump, get the rest of Big Brothers, and then it just brings it a little closer. So we're here, just so everyone. Yeah. I, how visible is that? I mean, I have a big monitor, so it works no, for me. Very, I don't know. Is that no, no, that's yeah. perfect. So what's our, is our map perfect now? Yeah, nice and square. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's always some little tweaking when we apply for the block grant piece. Usually, especially with capital projects, there's, they, they the block grant wants to know that we have contingencies and other things. so. You know, we recommend something the town manager does, and then when we complete the budget form, um, the CDBG always wants to have like you know two percent is set aside even for so you know there's always like something where we have to make it work. So the agency typically gets exactly what we recommend or what the town recommends. It might change a little bit, but you know we'll we'll make it work up to the maximum amount we can apply for. So does anybody? Greg, what are your thoughts on this? Do you have any any opinions on these? I'm sort of yeah. trying to figure out how what to call them: funding yeah. recommendations A, B, and C. No, I would go with the stick with the A. I just don't understand the rationale. Uh, I I know what the numbers look like, but I don't understand the rationale for for especially the first two. Uh, I know you, you. One of the things that you mentioned, not you, but the group mentioned, was the fact that uh, we may consider uh, past funding, but why, why? Why is that determinative of anything if we're gonna cut the other folks? Well, I'll, I'll speak to that because I think I, I may have mentioned that and, and that's yeah. because, you know, some of the, you know, when people make the applications, it's either for a new project or it's for a continuing project. And so survival center and family outreach are good examples of things that we've been funding um, for a while. And so um, to me, it just seems like if we're going to fund them to keep on funding them at roughly the same level, um, makes sense. It sends a statement that we're continuing to support them. We don't see any reason to, um, to decrease you know, obviously, unless there were other programs that were, you know, we felt were, you know, more, you know, worthy of the funding, but, but, um, you know, rather than, than um, to be asked the question, well, why did you, you know, cut funding for one group or another? Um, it's, I think, defensible to say, well, we're trying to keep it, you know, level funded even though with inflation, it, the money probably doesn't go as far, but it, it's a continuing program. And so we're trying to keep it uh, funded if we think it's really important. Yeah, and that was part of the same decision-making that I had was just looking at what they had previously been funded and what their funding request was. So 
the survival center was previously funded around 102. They requested 140. If they had requested 80, then that wouldn't have been a factor in my consideration. But that that was my rationale is just looking at what they had been funded at before. And um, not necessarily level funding it, but that was just part of what I used in my rationale. But does that mean that if they requested uh, initially more than 140, they would be getting more than 102? I don't get the connection if we're taken away from other programs. Well, we're, yeah, we would be taking away from all of them. Right, I think, you know, well, Suzanne I mean, had said- share, I mean, everybody's uh, losing the same percentage versus preferring to maintain closer some programs than others. I mean, we support all the programs, not just one. So would you- And we have three other programs that we're not funding at all. You right. know, so the rationale, it just doesn't make a whole lot of well, sense we... to me. But we only can, we're only allowed to fund five, which is why we're not funding the other ones at all, right? So we're, we're stuck with five. Um, right. But I'm wondering, so Greg, do you feel- well, See, but out of those five, those three, we did fund one last year. And this year, we're not worried about keeping it at the same level. Right. But we do support them and think they're doing real good things. Right. Uh, so why don't we treat them the same as the other people that we're funding? You know, it doesn't, doesn't make since uh, there's not enough uh, funds for everybody to get what they need or what they're requesting. I understand that. Uh, and I'm not saying that's a problem, but I'm, uh, I'm thinking that uh, there needs to be uh, a more rational way of distributing the money than just saying, uh, we gave you this much last year uh, and we're going to give you more than other folks because we're trying to maintain while we're cutting others, and I, and I know it's only a uh, hundred something, uh, but it's still more than the 101, 88, 88. So we're giving them more money in terms of the portion than other folks, and we're cutting other folks that we also do support. So do you think that it makes more sense than, I I hear you, that to, to do the the percentage, you know, to have everybody gets 72% or whatever the the one is in column A, or to divide 330,000 by five and everybody gets that and then figure out where the little leftover goes for Center for New Americans. Well, I, mean, I heard Suzanne you know, say that, you know, the, in the well, second column here at least, which is slightly different in the third, was that some of this was also based on the rankings over here, right? So the kind of the weighted scores of how the proposals, you know, were reviewed comparatively. And so, you know, if there's some strong proposals here, you know, maybe their budget um, isn't as reduced as some of the others. And, you know, I, I don't think there is a, a clear formula for this. And so if, you know, this is where it gets pretty tricky. And so, you know, but I'm also hearing, you know, discussions of how it, um, looks at their overall budget, how it looks at their program budget, activity budget, how it's compared to their overall review um, score and rankings and weight. And so to me, that's, that's, the, that's the rationale. We don't have, you know, a clear percentage, for instance, or, you know, something else, but we're taking all those factors and, and putting those into how we, we arrived at, you know, whether it's this or this. Um, you know, my concern with the percentage is everyone's just going to keep asking for more, knowing that we're going to do a straight percentage. And so next year, if I ask for 50 this year and I got 80 percent, well, next year I'm going to ask for 80, you know, I'm asked for 90. And, yeah. you know, so I, I, you know, I think it's I think it's I think there's a really it's a really difficult decision to make. Um, Could and, I just ask, so I'm just but I'm curious just to, to back to my question to Greg, whether what which of those if we're if we were going to do it sort of on that the equality basis. What which one of those do you think makes more sense or feels more equal out of columns E, F, and G? No, of everybody gets divided three thirty divided by five versus a, you know everybody gets seventy two percent. I don't understand what you mean by three thirty divided by five. Oh, so we have three hundred and thirty thousand dollars to give away. Oh, okay. If we yeah. divided. You know, we and we can give it to five organizations. So we pick the five. So if we just said everybody gets what is it, six hundred sixty-five thousand? 
66,000. 66,000. And then we have an additional, we have then, so everybody gets 20. that, but Center for New Americans only asked for 40. So there'd be 26,000 that we would then maybe divide equally amongst the rest of them. That's or, bonus. That's a bonus. I mean, that's no, right. but I think the center should get the 40. I mean, that's what they asked for. Right. Well, they wouldn't get the bonus. So, but I guess right. so my question is like, which one seems fairer? Is it that doing it that way or doing a percentage of what they asked for? The 330 divided by five seems to be more fair because I think A, it's, they can manipulate it by requesting more the next time, as, as you mentioned. And so if it's a portion, they would get more the next time. Uh, and that would be an incentive to over request in terms of pad your funding. Uh, and I'm not saying anybody's doing that now, but I'm saying that's the danger in doing it that way uh, in terms of rationale. Okay. Uh, and the problem with B, the second one, I think that's the closest. If we don't do it, you know, 330 divided by five, that's the closest to uh, what I think uh, the rationale, yeah, that one uh, could support. But, you know, and, and it's not a whole lot different than uh, a third suggestion. Um, but I don't understand the rationale. I mean, it, it's, it's just a little more arbitrary in terms mm -hmm. of what we decide, uh, who's important. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think I would prefer uh, the 330 divided by five. Can we put that in, Nate, and just make, can we do one more column just so we're looking at everything? I know it's, it's easier to envision that one, but. Okay, without the bonus. Right, so we'll have to. Add in, we'll have to figure out where the bonus goes. So everybody would get 6,500 more. So 66 plus 6,500, except for um, Center for New Americans. So 72,500. Doing it that way, family outreach and Craig's doors get the same amount, essentially the same amount that they would get in our in the final column. And the Brothers Big Sisters get significantly more. And so it's really Amherst Survival Center is the, the one that loses out the most. Yeah, I guess my my problem with doing it in such a formulaic way is the same problem with you know the other formula, which is you know pro rata, uh, which is it doesn't take into account you know our rankings. It doesn't take into account the um, kind of how valuable each program might be to the community, how many people it serves. Um, so survival center is a good example of of just you know, a hugely impactful uh, food pantry program that serves so many people. And as much as I support and applaud what Center for New Americans does just by nature of the, um, of the program, it just can't impact as many people directly. So I guess I, I don't favor the kind of formulaic allocation. I would like to take into account other factors, how we rank them, you know, the importance in the community and how many people they serve and, and the, the impact to the community. Um, so I think I'd like to take a more nuanced approach. 
Yeah, I mean, in coming up with my rankings, I, I, and and I, and we can't speak for the two people that are here, but I did look at what they were requesting for funding and the number of people that their programs support. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of am with you, Nat, that I feel like we'd be um, maybe slashing some some people that had a higher ranking. Um, and then why would we 100% fund Center for New Americans, which out of all of our rankings was, you know, second or third to last. Um, I mean, these are all amazing programs and I right, hate I to, know. this is really <laughs> difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right, so um, we are at 9.15, and I would say that we should probably try to reach, either reach consensus tonight or um, decide that we're going to continue to another night. Um, so um, we can vote. I, I think that maybe what we should do, Nate, is do two rounds of voting and do one vote that's just for the... Can you take them out? organizations and one vote that's the budget does that make sense or is it better just to do it all in one yeah i mean if we can if the committee can reach consensus you know um whatever is visible i mean we can highlight this is what's the capital and then you know it's a matter of just highlighting something here right. to show the vote um and that could work I, mean, I feel like the, I feel like there's already been agreement with the organizations. It's now really the, right. exactly. the budget piece. So. so Lori just raised her hand from Center for New Americans. So why don't we let her in and then um, we'll reach. Lori, you'll be asked to rejoin as an attend or as a panelist. I think so. That's. Hi, thanks for letting me in and thank you for this very deliberative process. Um, I feel like you've, you know, working really hard at acknowledging the spectrum of activities that both the community development block grant program statewide is designed to support and also what's in the Amherst master plan. I, I just want to say one quick thing listening to you debate. We did make a pretty modest ask we always have. Um, in the past, you have funded us at about 20,000 a year. Um, we were often encouraged to ask for more. Um, but we never did. I was, we were happy to get something. Um, I know that the numbers we put in might seem modest compared to what else you're looking at. I just want to remind you that every one of the adults that you support with us is also supporting children and other family members. So you're actually leveraging tremendous support. If you, if you talk to teachers in the Amherst Public Schools, ask the ELL teachers why they all support this program because the parents in our classes are giving their kids a better chance. So I guess you're trying to figure out how to allocate the budget and we'd be happy for anything you give us. Um, we were not funded last year, you're right. and um, we have been overwhelmed by Afghans, Ukrainians, Haitians, the waves just keep coming and it's almost beyond our capacity to welcome at this point and yet we really hate to say no. Um, and yet crowded classes are not effective. So um, we'd be happy for anything, but I just want you to say, think about the numbers in a more expansive way because every parent who helps their child makes a difference that way. So that's all I want to say. I know it's late and thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Roy. I'll change your role to attendee again. Frozen.
Okay, so um, if we were then to just try to achieve consensus on what the funding looks like, um, does somebody want to? I guess, Nate, I'm not sure how to do it. Make a motion to do everything that we've all agreed on and then one of these particular budgets? Well, yeah, I mean, if this is visible, you know, here's the proportional one that, you know, there's um, maybe some disagreement about. Here's the pro rata. Let me just, before I do anything too crazy, pro rata one here. Here's the weighted one where, you know, Suzanne had, um, you know, it, it looks at, you know, both the, the rankings and the, the score and also, you know, what, Kind of what the proposal is being, what was it being asked, and then you know here's the other um, fourth now column, and so you know to me it seems like this was one where it seemed like the committee was you know could be leaning as this weighted recommendations, um, you know, and I don't know if it needs to be any more tweaking or, you know, I. I think Becky was leaning towards H, which is uh. <laughs> that one. I don't know what what the, what it's called, but <laughs> I'll just say um, H. H. I actually, well, so, yeah. So I'll make my little pitch. I, you know, I, um, I think my my pitch for H is that um, I think it it's specific to the amounts that they ask for for specific things that CDBG for the for the. Sorry, I'm getting to my, oh my God, I've been awake for so long and talking. Um, what the what the, the CDBG funds would go toward, right? And so the Craig stores of the 72,000 that was sort of specific to a, a particular salary um, and with, um, I think we had, what, there was another one that made sense for that. So I, I think um, in that way, that one makes sense to me. I agree, I think the, the pro rata one does, I, I agree with what everybody I think has said, which is that that just encourages people to ask for more than they need, knowing that we might just go in and give everybody 60% or whatever it is. Um, so I think I lean toward H, um, but there is also then a part of me that really can a little bit see the benefit of E where it's not about, um, it's, this is the amount of money we have. All of these organizations, yes, they're weighted, but each of them is doing such incredibly important work in the community, and they each get the same amount to work with. So I sort of lean back and forth between those two. Yeah, I think I, I favor H. I think my... Um... One of the issues I have with with um, just the proportional is that it doesn't really take into account you know the rankings that we developed and also in in a, in a more complete way because um, it also doesn't take into account that you know we're trying to fund various um, areas and so even though, for example, Center for New Americans and Literacy Project, the funding amount, you know, requests were lower and the rankings were lower, we still wanted to include one of them. And so if we were simply going to do proportional funding, you know, I might not be as inclined to include that as a you know, priority. Mm. Whereas by you know, having uh, the more you know nuanced um, funding rec recommendations, like in column H, you know, I think we're able to uh, include some of those smaller amounts along with some of the um, you know really high priority things that the community has identified, and some of the programs that have been you know very very successful and important in the community, and you know fund those at a much higher level that I think they deserve. Um, Suzanne or Greg? Yeah, I mean, I would lean more towards um, H or G, um, probably H. I think those numbers, some of the, the reasoning we had, Becky, for changing some of those numbers was to get, um, 
you know, bump up Center for New Americans a little bit and get closer to, um, you know, like the family outreach of Amherst, which overwhelmingly had the highest ranking. Um, and so I think that's where those those bumps kind of came from in H. So I think I would lean that way um, out of all of these. <clears throat> and Greg, where are you at with these? I'm not sure. Oh, I think everybody makes a, a good argument for each one of the ways of doing it. Uh, you know, there's uh, positives and negatives for each one of them. Uh, I don't know that I can give you a firm yes, no on any of them today. Uh, I want to think about what, what Nate said. Uh, uh, so I would prefer to table it to the next meeting so we can think about what what, what people presented for these uh, these the four options. Yeah, four options. Um, okay, so I guess um, if we were to hold another meeting, um, which I think is on the calendar for the 26th or something of January. Um, I think what I'd like to do if, if we're going to do that is I would like us to vote and reach consensus right now on the non-social service organizations and the list of organizations we're going to give to so that when we reconvene and when we're joined by the other, probably the other two members of the committee, we're not revisiting everything that we yeah i i think for that reason i i have a fairly strong objection to kicking this down the road i think you know we all came prepared those of us who are here and i think you know we should be prepared to you know finish the job um i i lean that I way agree. also um because i think we could talk ourselves in circles and probably come up with four other versions of the um of other ways to fund. Um, I would love to achieve consensus, <laughs> but um, I know that I guess we just need to achieve majority. Um, so is this, this meeting on this date typically is not only to come up with the five projects, but also the five social services projects but to also make a recommendation for funding and then that's finalized in the next meeting or is the next meeting just in case we didn't do that today? Yeah, the next meeting on the 26th would have just been a fallback in case it couldn't have been made tonight. And so, okay. so yeah, so the process would be if this were voted, um, you know, uh, organizations and budget, we have a public hearing, which is required uh, as part of the block grant process, which is scheduled for February 2nd. So between now and then the hearing, I, staff would meet with the town manager. Um, Becky might be in the in the meeting as well as chair, and we'd review this discussion in the rankings. And the town manager would, you know, could make changes, right? Maybe they change the budgets a little bit as well, just thinking about things. But they would, you know, take the recommendations under advisement, and then before the public hearing, we'd publicize, you know, the quote final recommendations that would be included in the town's application. And so, it, typically, it's one or two meetings to do what we're doing tonight. I mean, usually it's unfortunately one long meeting, sometimes it's continued. So we do have that extra one, but it's not as if we have any other business necessarily to take care of on the 26th. Right. Okay. Or, or any more information that's going to come in. Right. Right. Like we so, haven't asked any for other clarifying questions. If we wanted to, we could have done that to whoever was present tonight. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Then I um, am going to move for that. We vote, and I never get this language right, but that we vote um, to fund the three non-social services as written here, um, the Southeast Project for it in, full, in full, the Valley CDC in full, and the remainder to go to the Belchertown Project. And then for the social services that we 
fund Family Outreach of Amherst, Amherst Survival Center, Big Brothers Big Sisters, Center for New Americans, and Craig's Doors, and that we fund them um, in the amounts as laid out in funding recommendation H. I would second that motion. So all in favor. It has to do a roll call. So it has to be, Becky, you'd have to call each individual member. They'd have to say yes or no. Um, so because Matt, we're online. Right. Um, so Matt, I'll go to you. So I would I would vote yes for that. Okay. And Greg? No. Okay. And Suzanne? Yes. Becky, are we, you cut out? I don't know. Oh, so um, I obviously made the motion, so I vote yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, it passes. Right. Um, and um, I think then we go on to our next agenda item. Yes, yeah, so that, that's, yeah, I think that's fair. And um, Greg, so we, you know, we'll have a meeting with the town manager. I think, you know, we have some, if you wanted to voice some other, you know, if you have any, any other comments now, and we can just re relay that. Um, when we meet with the town manager in terms of the funding recommendations for social services. Okay. Uh, we're just talking about the funding recommendations. I don't know. I didn't say no for uh, the five uh, social services or the non-social services. Right. It's, it's right. just the, the funding, how we fund. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to make clear of that. Uh, but uh, I don't have anything to add at this point. Sure. Okay. In right. terms of the uh, town manager. All right. Okay. I'll stop my share. So the other agenda items were um, you know, recommendations, review target areas, uh, public comment. So um, I think we've done that. I don't think we need to do anything with target areas. So okay. the way the block grant or the DHC regulations are is that um, the non-social service activities, so the capital projects have to be in a target area. So if, for instance, it's a chicken and egg um, problem, that's sometimes if the project we recommend is outside a target area, we might have to then change the target area <laughs> to match the project, which didn't happen this year. So I don't think we need to do anything that with that. And um, there's still two members of the public if we want any comment, I guess, Becky. Yeah. And so either Susan or Maya, my guess is that they're happy with what happened tonight and maybe are just smiling at home, hopefully. Um, or sleep. <laughs> or sleep. <laughs> neither one is raising their hand. We'll take that as a sign that they don't have anything to add. And so public comment will be over. Mm -hmm. And I think that the meeting can then be adjourned. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the unanticipated items. Um, Lucas emailed and said that he has, um, he's a sick family member. And so he emailed last minute and said that he uh, he couldn't make it. Um, and then for other um, nothing unanticipated, I guess the um, um, you know I don't have anything else. I guess I was going to say that we have a vacancy on the committee, and maybe I don't know if anyone's terms are coming up, but the town manager, you know, in the next few months, we're trying to fill vacancies. So if any members know of anyone who would be interested for next cycle, it, it's always good to get someone on board early as opposed to late. So, you know, the block grant does have a certain schedule throughout the year. And so it's hard to take someone in October when we've already started planning for the next year's grant cycle. So it's nice to have someone on board, you know, spring and summer, so they're ready for the fall. And we can always try to offer some training or workshops to get people comfortable with the process. But, you know, if you have anyone interested, they can, contact me or they can submit a CAF if they'd like. So Nate, I don't want to talk about it now because it's 9.30 and I know at least I have not even had dinner yet. Um, but um, I would, I do think it would be good to talk about at maybe at the public hearing to add to the agenda what it means for the committee that this was a two-year cycle mm -hmm. and that we likely wouldn't actually have any decisions to make potentially for a fairly ex extended period of time. Yeah, so the you know we have um, you know so the block grant committee in Amherst is a standing committee. Some communities it might be just tied to the block grant process or cycle, and it may be that they um, they might have the select board or another committee act as kind of this you know the, your role. Um, so typically, if everything goes well and the activities 
get under contract and everything. The committee doesn't necessarily need to review anything. We try to send you quarterly reports, but um, in the off chance that a project comes in under budget or sometimes projects don't come to fruition. So, you know, say for instance, Belchertown Road, although the town has some funding, what if it, what if the product didn't happen? We'd have to reallocate that funding and we'd actually go through a mini RFP round and then the committee would make recommendations again to the town manager. So oftentimes after the application is submitted, there's a, you know, the committee might not meet for three months and then we can meet as needed, you know, throughout the summer. So typically, right, the committee might have a little bit of a, of a, of a downtime. Mm -hmm. um, and then right now that it's a two year cycle, um, it's interesting, we have to have a hearing during the program year to hear comments on the um, current activities, but because it's a two year cycle, that might not happen for a year. So yeah, geez, I hadn't really thought about that. You know, I would probably meet at least maybe quarterly with everyone just to, you know, at, you know, if, if at the least just meet every three months, just for a quick meeting to check in and give you updates, but it, that could be a really quick meeting. Okay. So um, right now the next planned meeting is February 2nd, correct for a public hearing, mm -hmm. um, but you'll let me know, Nate, if you need me for anything in between now right. and then. Okay, thank it you all like, so much for your incredible- It looks like Maya has raised her hand, actually. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Maya, right, so you can come in as a panelist. Hi, hi there, guys. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't wanna keep you. I just had a technical question. And um, I, I, to introduce myself, my name is Maya, I'm the Director of Development and co-director of finance at Craig Stores. I just wanted, I had a clarifying question about the um, the funding cycle, because you guys have been talking about it as a two-year grant, but the budget that we submitted was 18 months. So I wanted to kind of check in and um, and just clarify that. Yeah, so uh, DHCD wants a safeguard to know that all the money could be spent in two years. So they, they really were asking for an 18-month implementation window knowing that the program itself may be two years. So you could take, we have, we have to spend um, most likely 80 or 90% of the funding within 18 months. And then we have the ability to spend the remainder between 18 and 24 months. But, um, you know, DHC really wants to know that the activities will get started and be spent down consistently. So typically we'll enter into a contract then for a two year period. And if you spend your money down, you can spend it down in the first six months but it's a two-year program. So you're still gonna have to submit quarterly reports you know, for two years because it's a two-year contract and activity. So um, you know, I think the 18 month um, implementation budget was really a safeguard to know that the, you know, it looks like it's feasible to be completed within the grant period. Okay, yep. awesome. Yeah, no, thanks. That's, we often get that question. Yeah, great, okay. Um, thank you, guys. thanks for your work. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm actually, I'm going to head out, but thank you so much for deciding to fund us this year. Yeah. Have a good night. Good night. Um, all right. We're good? Yeah, I think we're good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bon appetit. <laughs> thanks. Let's see what they made for me upstairs. <laughs> <laughs>